Hello, everyone. I'm Lana Zak. Thank you so much for joining me. The U.S. could approve a third coronavirus vaccine soon. Johnson & Johnson has filed for emergency use authorization with the FDA. That authorization may now just be a few weeks away. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine requires only one dose and doesn't need to be stored in extra cold temperatures. As of Thursday evening, more than 35 million vaccine doses from Pfizer and Moderna had already been administered. More than 57 million had been distributed. While the rate of infection in the U.S. has recently dropped, experts warn that the virus is still spreading, and so are its variants. The total number of cases is now above 26.6 million. More than 455,000 Americans have died. Meg Oliver leads off our coverage in Montclair, New Jersey. Tonight, Johnson & Johnson filing with the FDA for emergency use authorization approval for its one-dose vaccine. The vaccine could be available in March. Even as restrictions ease, hospitalizations and new COVID cases decline, the concern grows among the nation's top infectious disease doctors. This is not the moment to let our guard down. Within six to 12 uh, weeks, we could be seeing the very worst of the pandemic to date. The virus is still spreading at extraordinarily high rates. My biggest concern right now is that people are fatigued, they're frustrated. Dr. Celine Gounder advised the Biden transition team and is an epidemiologist at New York University. These variants will continue to spread, continue to mutate, and at the end of the day, we could end up having vaccines that no longer work. There are some reports saying they could become dominant by March. How lethal could it be? A person infected with that strain is more likely to have severe disease and die. There's promising news of a new antibody test being developed by scientists at the University of Denver. It could determine whether someone testing positive for COVID will have mild or more severe symptoms. But tonight, reopening schools remains an enormous obstacle, some still operating virtually after almost a year. Megan Calusa teaches special education in a San Francisco public school, but wants proper protocols implemented before returning to the classroom. We truly believe by pushing to ensure that all the appropriate safety measures are in place, that we're doing what's right for our children and their families. Meanwhile, in Chicago, a tense standoff persists between the city and the teachers union, refusing to return. Mayor Lori Lightfoot says they've spent more than $100 million on ventilation, masks, and safety protocols. Black and brown kids who look like me, coming from circumstances like the one that I grew up in, who are struggling and are failing. We are failing those children by not giving them the option to return to school. Tonight, the mayor of Chicago says time has run out for the nation's third largest school district, and it's telling the union they need a deal by midnight. Meanwhile, the union says they're working in the 11th hour to reach an agreement. Lana. For more, let's bring in infectious disease expert Dr. Amesh Adalja. He's a senior scholar at Johns Hopkins University's Bloomberg School of Public Health. Let's start off, first of all, by talking about uh, these variants, uh, especially the ones that were first identified in South Africa and Brazil. Uh, we understand that it's more difficult uh, to identify them here in the United States. Why is that? And how have these new strains impacted our path to recovery? The reason it's more difficult to identify them is that we're not sequencing enough of our positive test results. Probably only 1% of our cases are getting sequenced to look and see, is this the original type of the virus or is this one of the variants? Whereas in other countries, they're closer to 10%. So this is something we're going to need to scale up because we want to have situational awareness, knowing where these variants are, what percentage of cases they represent, and how people are faring with them. Are they more contagious? Are, how are people who are vaccinated doing when they get exposed to these variants? All of that's very, very important as we move forward into this next phase of the pandemic. And Dr. Adelja, some manufacturers are working on improving their vaccines to be ready for any variant, but there are thousands of variants out there and may continue to develop. Researchers believe that our current vaccines actually do work against the new strains. So can you help us understand what improving a vaccine might look like? So it's important to know that our current vaccines do work very well against the variants when it comes to what matters, serious disease, hospitalization, and death. What we're seeing with the South African variant and probably the Brazilian variant is that the vaccine isn't as protective 
in when it comes to getting infected or having a symptomatic infection. So when we improve a vaccine, what it does is basically kind of tweak it. And the fact that we use these vaccine platforms that really didn't exist a decade ago makes it a much easier prospect to actually just modify the vaccine in such a way that it reflects the, the changes in the protein of the coronavirus, the spike protein that's mutating in these variants. Most variants are not going to need this, but I do think that there has been some concern raised about the South African and Brazilian variants so that you may see companies, and there are companies, talking about doing this ahead of time. Hopefully, we don't need to deploy them. Hopefully, we can stay ahead of these variants so that our current vaccines will work. But I think it's important to know that there may be a chance that we might have to update them. But it's not for preventing severe disease or death, but maybe just to give just a little more protection on symptomatic disease. And Dr. Delja, you are an expert in infectious diseases. Um, British researchers have launched a new study to test the efficacy of mixing and matching coronavirus vaccine doses. What is your take on this? Are there major risks associated with this mixing and matching approach? It's unclear right now, but I do think that because we have basically a menu of vaccines using new technologies, there may be an opportunity to improve vaccines by using one, one vaccine for the first dose, another for the second dose, or it also could be the case that maybe in a certain area they run out of a dose and we need flexibility so that they can use another dose. But the important thing about this is that it has to be guided by evidence. So I do think that these trials are appropriate, and I think we will get a lot of good information on these new vaccines and how they work. Ideally, we want to keep people on the same path of if you got Pfizer first, you get Pfizer the second time, Moderna, Moderna. But there may be some situations where it might be better to get one, one type of vaccine and then another type of vaccine, and we won't know until we try. So I think as long as it's being done in the studied fashion, in, in a study, I think it's a good thing to, to move forward with. And Dr. Anthony Fauci says that children could begin receiving the vaccine by late spring or early summer. What kind of data is needed before these shots can be given to kids? And would they receive the same vaccines as adults? Not necessarily. You have to remember that any vaccine is a risk-benefit calculation. And we know that children, thankfully, are spared from the severe consequences of this disease. So the risk-benefit ratio that a nine-year-old faces when debating whether to be vaccinated versus a 90-year-old is very different. So we want to make sure that the side effects are tolerable and don't outweigh the, the benefits that they get from this. We also want to make sure that their, their bodies react to the vaccine in the same way, that their immunity is the same. And it may be, eventually, that a different type of vaccine against coronavirus is, is used in children. It may not necessarily necessarily be the Pfizer or the Moderna. It may be something we don't know about. But it's really important to remember that when you look at this vaccine program, it's really about reducing the damage the virus causes. And that is the elderly people, nursing home residents, those individuals who get severe disease, who get hospitalized, who put pressure on our hospital capacity, and who die. So that's why this initial vaccine is about protecting the vulnerable populations, to basically defang this virus and make it much more like other coronaviruses that cause the common cold and are never public health emergencies. Dr. Delja, thank you for joining us. Thank you.